Hey guys and welcome back to the channel and welcome to my 486 wannabe. Uh, wait, that's that's not correct. I will be moving on to the 486 in a bit, but I just want to give the Packard Bell a little bit of love here. While the 486 was actually part of a package deal that included this Packard Bell PC. Now I know that Packard Bell usually gets a bad rap in the retro community for some reason. And I'm also not a very huge fan. On the inside, things are rather boring. We have the SIS chipset here, which is, you know, pretty ordinary. I think the most extraordinary thing in this computer is the AMD K62 CPU, which I rather like. So this is a 500 megahertz CPU. And I think this is an overall great platform for, you know, a late 90s retro computer. So for that reason, I might give this computer a chance, but I mean, it already didn't want to start at first. I thought it was going to be an issue with the power button because it has, it had like this weird feel to it. So I thought, you know, maybe, you know, some of these computers had like these cheap power buttons on these ATX platforms. And I thought this was going to be the case here, but I measured everything and the power button seemed to be fine. So I actually found the real culprit to be the power supply, as I don't think that this brown spot here on this PCB looks particularly normal. So something obviously blue in this power supply. But not to worry, because I have lots of ATX power supplies, so I thought I'd give this one a little spin. And sure enough, after installing it in the computer, I was able to start the computer just fine. Notice it had Windows XP installed. Although I think originally it was going to have Windows 98. So I'm really not sure what to do with this one. Either I'm going to keep it and see if I can turn it into some kind of useful retro machine. Feel free to let me know in the comments what you would suggest me to do with it. Keep it, turn it into a retro machine or just get rid of it. But main focus of this video is going to be this beautiful 486 to the right. Or at least that's what I think it is. Because you can never be sure, and that's part of the fun of buying these old retro computers, finding out what exactly is in there. But, I mean, when I look at the case, I see a fairly modern AT style case. I mean, we have the speed indicator, silicon computer. We don't have any CD-ROM. We only have the disk drive here. We have the power button, turbo reset button, and the key lock. All pretty standard, but yeah, fairly modern. So I would guess Pentium, but the fact that it doesn't have a CD-ROM player, I'm going for 486. Now, when we move to the back, things are again very basic. We have the power supply, we have the DIN-style keyboard connector, we have some I.O. ports, serial game port, parallel port, another serial port, and the VGA card is pretty interesting. Now, when you see a VGA card at the bottom of a PC like this, and the D-sub connector is positioned like this, you can be pretty sure that this is going to be a 16-bit ISA video card. And this most likely means it's going to be a 386 or 486, and not a Pentium. And the insides of this PC look really good. I mean, the case is, is almost shiny. I mean, there is a little bit of dust beneath, but overall, I mean, it's in excellent shape. As you can see, it has a very small motherboard, so that kind of reminds you of a 386. But when we look at the CPU, we can clearly see that 486 is written on it. So what gives? Now, with a system like this, sometimes you got to take a leap of faith, and I'm just going to be hooking up a monitor, a mouse, and a keyboard to this thing and just fire it up and see what happens. If it blows, it blows, but hoping for the best and we do hear the memory ticking away and slowly but surely we see the CRT monitor lighting up and we see the PC posting, which is excellent. No fireworks, just a PC that works right off the bat. That's good. Let's hear this again. I mean, don't you just love the startup sound of these old PCs? I mean, the disk drive and the hard drive working away. I mean, yeah, this is really nice. So let's take a closer look at the hard drive. Yeah, this is really great. Hard drive initializing, the computer starting. I love these old computer sounds.
Now inside the case, we get a glimpse of the system specifications. So we have a DLC 486 40 megahertz and the people who are paying attention will probably see that 486 used to be 386. So this computer got kind of an upgrade. We also see that it has a Connor ATA 340 megabyte hard drive, a VGA card with one megabytes of memory, two serial ports, one parallel port, four megabytes of RAM and the hard drive specifications. So the cylinders, heads and sectors are also marked here. So let's see what the system looks like when we turn it on. So we get the AmiBIOS copyright 1992. This is an MXIC motherboard from 93. Nothing special you might think, but what if I told you that this was a motherboard for 386 CPUs? We also see that the system has four megabytes of RAM. And we see the CPU identified as a CX486DLC. Now, CX typically means Cyrix and 486 means 486, right? So we have a 40 megahertz CPU clock and 128 kilobytes of shadow RAM. Here we can also see the four megabytes of RAM. We have a hard drive of user type 47 and the machine is booting up just fine into MS-DOS shell. So let's exit this one. So we have MS-DOS version 5.0 installed. Check disk reveals a couple of allocation unit errors, but in the end we get the 340 megabyte hard drive disk space as promised by the label. Let's change the keyboard layout. And we have a substantial set of software here, including some great games. Now, if that doesn't get the juices flowing, I don't know what will. Just look at those excellent graphics and PC speaker sound. Obviously, I'm not very good at this game, but at least we get a nice outro here. Another classic is this Indianapolis 500. Not taking into account my driving skills, this is a pretty fun game. Obviously, you also have Pac-Man here and Tetris. And no retro PC is complete without Banner Mania, of course. But this isn't all about software, so let's look into the computer itself and find out what hardware it has. So this is a 16-bit ISA controller card, nothing special there. We have the VGA card, which is also a 16-bit ISA, Oak technology with one megabytes of RAM. So let's disconnect some cables here so that we can get the motherboard out of the case and take a closer look at this one because this is actually quite special. So let's unscrew a couple of screws and get it out of the case. And one of the first things you'll notice is just how small this motherboard is. And this is a typical, you know, late 386 motherboard, but this has a 486 CPU installed. So what's going on here? We also have a Math Co Pro installed. So we'll need to take a closer look at this one. So here I have all the components that make up this little PC and I'm just blown away by the simplicity of this. I mean, this is what you got in the early 90s for endless hours of computer fun. So you got your hard drive for storage, your disk drives for your floppies, motherboard, video card, controller card, some cables, and that's basically it. So let's take a closer look at the motherboard. We have obviously four megabytes of RAM, four times one megabyte. And the heart of this PC is this Texas Instruments 486 DLC CPU accompanied by this math coprocessor from ULSI Systems. Now what's remarkable here is that this 486 CPU actually has a 386 form factor and is installed in a 386 motherboard. So this was actually a kind of a cheap upgrade options for those who had a 386 and wanted to have some of that 486 power. So in essence, you've got a CPU, which is pin compatible with 386 CPUs, but the internals are equivalent to an Intel 486. 
Now that doesn't change the fact that you're running this CPU off of a 386 motherboard. So the buzz interface is identical to that of an Intel 386. Now, as this was primarily targeted to compete with low end 486 systems, systems that didn't have a math coprocessor, the fact that the CPU was installed on a 386 motherboard meant that you could get a relatively cheap 386 math coprocessor. And that would definitely give you a performance boost. Next up, we move to the battery on the motherboard, and this looks remarkably clean. I will be replacing it, obviously, because I don't want any leaks in the future. Moving along to the chipset, which is provided by a company called Macronix, hence the MXIC name in the motherboard. Now, these are two MX chips that make up the chipset. We also have five 16-bit ISA slots and an additional 8-bit ISA slot. And just to prove to you guys that this is indeed a 386 motherboard, just look at the Ami BIOS label here. Moving along to the video card, we have the 16-bit ISA Oak Technologies VGA card. Now this is a pretty standard VGA card, it doesn't really excel. It has a 16-bit ISA bus, it has 1 megabytes of RAM. This is not a speed demon like the Tseng Lab, but I mean it's a fairly decent card, perhaps a tad faster than the Trident cards that you see a lot. The controller card is pretty basic as well. We have the connectors for the hard drive and the floppy drive. What I like about these cards is they have lots of jumpers typically to configure the various serial ports and parallel ports. And this is a gold star chipset based IO controller card. But again, yeah, nothing special, just a couple of IO ports and that's it. The hard drive is a Connor 340 megabyte hard drive and it has this really distinct Connor sound. It also has this typical Connor look. I mean, if you take a look at a Connor hard drive of 30 megabytes or you take a look at one from 340 megabyte, it looks exactly the same. Here we have the high density disk drive from Panasonic, pretty basic 1.44 megabyte disk drive, standard stuff. And that makes up this entire PC, but it is missing a vital component. And that component is this guy here. Because you gotta have some sound in your 486. If you wanna enjoy these early 90s games, you need to have a Sound Blaster. And I luckily I have a Sound Blaster 16 card here. It's not entirely period correct because this dates from 1995, so consider it a late upgrade. This is not plug and play, so you need to configure everything using jumpers, but that's fine. The default settings should work. And this will give the PC an entirely new dimension, of course, because you can get rid of that PC speaker sound and enjoy the beautiful sounds of this creative sound blaster. So let's pop this bad boy into the computer get our Sound Blaster 16 driver's disk and install the audio software, which is pretty straightforward. So we can go with all of the defaults. It's going to install the MS-DOS drivers and the Windows drivers. We can use the standard settings. I mean, everybody who has ever owned a creative Sound Blaster card will remember these iconic settings, such as the base IO, the IRQs and the DMAs. And it will start copying some files into the Windows folder, into the SB16 folder. And then we can use the diagnostic tools to check to see if everything is working. And I just love these sound tests, the 8-bit, 16-bit, and the MIDI sound. 8-bit testing. 8-bit testing. 8-bit testing. 16-bit testing, 16-bit testing, 16-bit testing. Don't you just love it? I mean, this is really music to my ears, quite literally. So with the Sound Blaster installed, it's time to look at some games and see how they sound with this Sound Blaster card installed. So let's take a look at stunts again. So yeah, we're definitely still on the PC speaker. So let's see if we can exit the game and configure the Sound Blaster card. 
So it's a standard option. And when we load it again, just take a listen. Now that's more like it. In the end of this video, I'll show you a couple of other games with that typical early 90s Sound Blaster sound. And the Sound Blaster installation didn't only install the MS-DOS drivers, but we also have sound in Windows. Ta-da! Now who doesn't remember that iconic Windows startup sound, the creative mixer and the shutdown sound of Windows 3.1. And to conclude this video, I just want to show you a couple of games I found on this computer here. With the Sound Blaster installed, it was a blast from the past to kind of relive these old games again. So I highly recommend everybody getting a retro PC just to try out a couple of MS-DOS games. Even the not so great ones. I mean, just listen to that sound and just notice the controls of the car. I mean... <laughs> But then other games like, for example, Iron Man will give you lots of fun on a system like this. I mean, I have lots of fun memories playing this game when I was a kid. And also platform classics like Commander Keen or Bio Menace. I mean, yeah, really fun to replay these games a bit. And I'm going to be leaving it at that for now. So I hope you've enjoyed this video. I'm off to play some Jimmy White classic snooker. Um, I'm probably going to do a little bit more of an in-depth video on this computer and comparing it with other 386 and 486 class machines if I have the time. And in the meantime, you can always check out Ancient Electronics, a great YouTube channel covering retro PCs. He has a great video on a Cyrix 486 DLC 40 MHz, similar like the one that I have here, but his is branded Cyrix. He has a couple of benchmarks and he compares it to other CPUs. So definitely check out that video and check out his channel. He has lots of great content over there. So I hope to see you guys in the next video. Everybody stay safe and I'll see you guys soon. Bye bye.